Welcome to Tech Talks with Damon. My special guest today is Wayne Hoffman, author, activist, New York personality. And we are getting some ducks in, quacking in the background. I'm gonna put them up here. We got the share duck. How are you doing today, Wayne? Awesome, how are you? Thank you for coming to Brooklyn. Thank you for being in my tub. It's great to meet you. It's great to meet you in your tub. <laughs> you know, I think people don't always realize that sometimes I know the guests, but sometimes I'm just meeting you the first time, like jumping in the bathtub. I always really appreciate when people who I don't know are like, yeah, I'll just come sit in the bath. That's the best part. Talk about life. So, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so, first thing I'm asking my guest, Wayne, is what do you like most about your body? That's a tough question. Um, so liking this body took a while. Uh, I spent a lot of time not liking things about it. I was never, when I was 20, I never felt like the right kind of 20 year old. I was never the cute perky twink. I mean, I tried, but it was never fooling anybody. And then when I got older, I sort of, you know, maybe I could have been a bear cub, but I wasn't quite right. And, I always felt like I was out of shape, I didn't have the right body, I was too fat. And it took a while to get over that. It took really, for me, discovering bears who looked at me and said, we like that. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, okay, I can get on board with this. You like it, I like it. The funny thing is, I like this on other guys. I just never liked it in the mirror. So it took a while to get around to saying, yeah, actually, if I saw him walking down the street, I'd look at him. That took like 20 years to get to. Wow. So what age did you feel like you started to really embrace your physical form and all of your hair and shape? Probably late 30s. Yeah. Um, which makes sense because I always, even from the time I was 20, I was looking at guys who were 40 and over. That was really pretty much the cutoff was 40 and over. Uh -huh. And... I was always going out with older guys. I was always chasing older guys. When I was, I think, 38, I met a guy who was my age, who had the same attractions for older guys. And for each of us, it was the same time we were interested in someone our own age. Uh -huh. And I realized, oh, right, this is the age where it starts. Now I, I finally hit the age where I find men hot. Uh -huh. um, so it got easier. Like from wow. 40, it got much easier. Now, when you were young, did you, do you feel like there were people in the community directly who communicated that you quote, should look different or not have body hair? Or um, was it more like this indirect media it, thing? It was both. Um, so when I, when I, like when I first moved to New York, I lived in Chelsea. This uh -huh. is back in the 90s, in the early 90s. Early 90s. Like 93. Okay. And when I would go out to bars, and I went out to bars a lot because I was 22 at the time, uh -huh. um, I didn't fit in in those crowds. And Meaning what? I felt like I'd go to a bar like, let's say G or Splash, uh -huh. and to go back a while. And the guys there had a certain look, they had certain kinds of bodies, they were certain kinds of clothes, and I wasn't interested in those kinds of clothes, and I didn't have that kind of body, and I was never going to have that kind of body. It was never going to happen. Did you find those bodies erratically desirable? No. Okay. Um, so it took a while for me to find the scene I liked, and what I finally did, I find it in a place like Rawhide, mm -hmm. or The Spike, mm -hmm. um, and those places I found the guys attractive, but there I was like um, 20 years too young to really get it. Some guys would pay attention to me, but for the most part, I was the kid hanging out in the leather bar and not in the hot way. <laughs> That's more like the tourist. I, I'm not going to overplay it. I had plenty of fun. Like, uh -huh. I got plenty of attention. I got more attention than most people deserve. But it's not about reality. It's about how you feel yourself. Mm. And when I looked in the mirror, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was working. Um, and I think when I hit 40 it's really when I started going, right, this is the person I was always meant to be. This makes sense. The beard makes sense. Going gray makes sense. Having a gut makes sense. Like, it all fits together. Wow. It took a while, though. Wow. Okay. So by 40, you were able to arrive at being, really being able to look in the mirror and, and see your sexy beauty. Yeah. I know sometimes. Yes, yeah, sometimes. 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 Yes, sometimes. sometimes. Okay, and, and the... Now, mind you, through all this, I can hear my husband watching this and rolling his eyes and going, oh, my God. Like, you walk down the street and people look at you and you're an idiot and you get 
more attention than you realize and what are you complaining about? But again, it's not about reality. It's about, well, it's about what, our you see, perception. what you see. Right? And so what I find, it's so interesting. I've been working now as a therapist for new, for over 25 years, most of that time with gay men. And just this whole, like you said, the difference between reality and perception, no matter what someone looks like. So I, you know, the whole 25 years, I've had plenty of those guys, the Splash Boys that you would describe, that we would now probably describe as Hell's Kitchen uh, twinks. And, and they look in the mirror and perceive disgust and disapproval the Absolutely. same exact way. This took a long time to realize. I mean, I'd, I'd gone, I started going to Bear Week about a dozen years ago in Provincetown every summer. I still go every summer. I really love it. Uh, because Bear Week is a place where, even if it's not all bears, it's a place where no one's going to give me shit for being a big guy. And I can walk down the street with my shirt off and either people like it or they're, they're not going to say anything. Right. Uh, but I remember many years ago, there was a big cluster of guys who came one year who were these big muscle bears, like unbelievable bodies, really big, muscly, hairy bears. And they tended to know each other and dance together in a cluster at tea bands. We called them the tea monsters. They were you know, these big muscular guys. And some people really thought, oh, they're kind of stuck up assholes and they don't like the other bears. I said, you know what, the funny thing is, is if you talk to them, a lot of them also have problems with their own bodies. We look at them and think like, oh, come on, it's ridiculous, but that's not how they see themselves either all the time. Right, that oftentimes, I would say almost all the times, that when people are standoffish or appear snobby in a public social situation, it is often, if not always, because they are dealing with their own insecurities yes. and fears. And they might not make sense to you. Right, because again, we're not talking about what's rational, we're talking about perception. Right. And I think one of the things we can do at this stage as gay men is, is really be direct with people of all ages and sizes about like, let's see if we can align our experience, our perceptions with reality. Like, okay, so you're getting checked out by guys. Um, when you walk down Chelsea, when you are in the West Village, you do get checked out. That's an objective fact, yes. but that is not always your lived experience. And also, the the turned heads um, occupy one part of your brain, uh -huh. and the other part of your brain are the thing, the nasty things people have said that just sort of stick in your mind. Mm -hmm. I remember once being at a, a club, because years ago I was probably 22 or something, and I took my shirt off, mm -hmm. and these... Two guys were walking by me, and one says to the other in a stage whisper, oh, why is it always the wrong guys who take their shirts off? This was some random guy I didn't know, I didn't care about, a stranger. Um, there's no reason I should have cared what he said. I didn't, quote, care what he said, but I remember it, like, very crisply in my memory. Uh, more crisply than I remember the guys who turned around and whooped at me on commercial street in Provincetown, uh -huh. like that uh -huh. sticks in my head. It's, it's just how criticism goes. So isn't that interesting too, yeah. that that one negative comment outweighs perhaps the hundreds yep. of really positive comments yes. and feedback you've received yeah. and how selective our minds are yes. in terms of that. And again, this is why I think, I think that in many ways right now, this is such the ideal time for us to be challenging those notions and think about what we're thinking about so we can have greater levels of joy and connection and pleasure and not say hurtful things. Because when you say that, like when you heard that comment that the guy said, what I hear is like, oh, well, that's all fear. Like he's afraid to do that. And instead of going within and acknowledging, are you okay? Yeah, I just don't want to squish you. Oh, you're not. Oh my God, don't worry about squishing me. I'm, I'm tough. Um, tougher than I love him. Um, he, w instead of thinking about these things and going introspective with those things, he projects his fear outwards. The, the logic is, well, I can't take my shirt off. Right. I feel like I have a hideous body, so you better not do it either, either because I'm not allowed to do it, so you better not do it. There's also, there's some kind of, I think a lot of times with gay men, there's a notion that you have two options in how you respond to someone. One is one is approval, which means attraction. Uh -huh. And the other is, if you're not attracted, you have to disapprove. Uh -huh. So there's no notion that, well, no, I don't want to have sex with you right now, yet you look great. Uh -huh. Or maybe you're not my type, but really, who cares? Like, good for you, you look terrific. Or 
I see you've been working out and you want to get more muscular. That's great. Or I think you wanted to lose weight and you did. And congratulations. Or you decided you didn't care about losing weight and good for you or anything. But um, the notion that we have to pass judgment one way or the other, yes. that there's nothing neutral. And it's, it's one of the things that I liked at, at Bear Week the first time I went. I'm a bear. I like bears. I don't exclusively like bears, but I do like bears. But it doesn't mean that I want to have sex with every bear I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, 75%, but not 100%. Uh -huh. And... But at Bear Week, there does seem to be an acknowledgement that, let's say someone else takes their shirt off at tea dance or on the street. Mm -hmm. The range of appropriate responses is attraction and woofing or something mm -hmm. to, you know, polite golf claps for your moxie. Uh -huh. And that's about it. But you can't talk shit about someone. Uh -huh. You can't, first of all, it's not your business. It's not your place. And the world outside Bear Week is shitty enough sometimes. Yeah. So, like, that's a place where... You don't have to love everyone, you don't have to be attracted to everyone, but you can't talk shit about someone and you can't slam them and you can't body shame them. Like, not for one week in one city, none of that, please. Yeah. So this is why it's so valuable for us to have safe spaces. Yeah. Safe fur spaces, perhaps, because I know people still have experiences. Yeah. But something that's set like Bear Week, and I've written about this as well, that people can find community in who they are and what whom they're attracted to like yes. right now we are talking and there's going to be this major leather convention in chicago that some of my other guests have talked about again yes. building community and safety around saying we may not always agree with each other but we're going to respect the fact that we all love leather and we all enjoy this and even if we're not 100 percent into it we respect that you're right. into it right. and just really like yeah you can like walk around this hotel with whips and chains and pups and you know right. gags and no one's going to be like oh my god you're just get like run in the other direction and you don't have to be into it right but if you're not like just, just, just don't once, yuck the just yums quiet. don't yuck my yums. don't yuck the yums which I think is a good thing to practice no matter what, but I think is especially valid and true and more of the, the norm at Bear Week or IML yeah. or specific kind of like weeks that people gather for with, with intention. And, you know, there was a, I had a discussion at Bear Week a couple years ago because the past couple of years during the pandemic, it's been a little different, but mm -hmm. Bear Week has gotten um, broader in the people it draws in Provincetown. I think this is true of Bear Spaces in general, but certainly Bear Week in, in, in particular, in that a lot of people who maybe don't identify as bears have started going. Mm -hmm. Either because they see, let's say they're over, 50, 40, over 40 or 50, and they say, wow, Bear Week is really one of the older weeks of the season. Guys over 50 aren't considered old during Bear Week. They're mm -hmm. like right in the middle of the demographic. So even though I'm not a bear, I'm older, and that's a good older week. Or um, they're not really into a, the druggy party scene and like Bear Week isn't so much of that. It's more of a beers and buffet kind of scene. We're going to go Bear Week then. Or maybe because they have facial hair or whatever reason they're drawn to bear culture in some way even or though they're not going bears. Or I want to fuck them. But I remember talking to a couple of sort of old school bears a few years ago and they were complaining that the demographic had gotten watered down and now there were fewer and fewer of the sort of old school capital B bears. Um, and they felt like, which I get, they felt like this was our space. And, and now the people who are coming, there are fewer and fewer sort of bear classic capital B trademark bears uh, than there used to be. Uh, and that bothered them. And I said, well, that's one way to think of it. Or you can think of it the other way and think that you made a space that's so accepting that lots of people want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a great thing. Like, congratulations, it worked. Mm -hmm. You built a place where lots of different people feel drawn because they don't feel judged. Yeah. And so even if they're not bears, they they like bear spaces for that yeah. reason. And we could gripe that they don't look the same, or we could be happy that you know you built a safe space and that people like it. Right. There's a trade off to that. There is because we do want to keep it as a safe space. Yeah. And I, but on the other hand, I hear you know the, I hear Archie Bunker like those were the days. Right. I you mean, know, things, things always were better be. than they used to right. be, and it right. was you know we used to have these. So so I think it can go both ways. I don't think you can really fight change. I think if people really feel strongly about that, that they can think about creating the kind of space that they want to see instead yes. of complaining with other people. Or are doing. a subspace, create a party within right. a week, and people do that. Right. Um, I know, like, in the 90s, when I was in my 20s, I used to go to um, the Russian River for Bear Week, like, you know, and get a chance, because it was, A, because I was, like, older, hairier guys, and B, it was just the vibe. It was just so 
open. It seemed less attitude-y. Yes. And more fun and more playful and silly than most other gay spaces. And also, you know, to speak in broad generalizations, more um, physically affectionate without always being sexual. Yeah. Just sort of, there's lots of hugging, yeah. lots of belly rubs, lots of all that stuff that isn't necessarily about sex. There's a good middle ground with theirs that's hard to find other places. Yeah. So your work and your creative energy has really varied a lot throughout your career. Yeah. And I want to ask about that, but I think this is one of the themes that we see is body positivity, yeah. um, thinking about ways that things can be better and that people can feel better and more playful and joyful and sex positive yes. in their lives. Yes. So let's talk about some of the forms that has taken over the last yeah. 30 years. So, I mean, my first novel, Hard, came out in 2006. Uh -huh. And the main character of Hard is named Mo Perlman, and he's a 20-something, this takes place in the 90s. He's 20-something, a grad student, aspiring journalist, which is kind of who I was at the time. Mm -hmm. It's often the case with first novels. And he's trying to wrestle with his own body image, uh, and also getting eye rolls from people around him who are going, you have sex all the time, What's, what are you complaining about? But he doesn't... He hasn't found a place where he feels comfortable. And at this point, bear culture is a really brand new thing that he's kind of vaguely aware of, but he's not part of it. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to An Older Man, which is my third novel, which is a sequel to Hard, it's 15 years later, and he has now found his place in Beardom, and the whole novel takes place at Bear Weekend, Provincetown, Ooh. Um, where the issue he's dealing with is no longer body image, but it's age. Uh -huh. He, Mo is used to being the 20 something guy chasing after guys in their 40s and 50s, and now he's in his 40s. And the trouble is that a lot of the guys he's looking at aren't looking back anymore because now he's aged out. A lot of the daddies are looking for someone younger, and he's oh. now he's their age, and he's not the cute young thing anymore. And during the course of the novel, a cute young thing starts pursuing him, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know what to do. What why would he be looking at a guy in his 20s? He's never looked at guys in his 20s, mm -hmm. even when he was in his 20s. And now he's faced with this young man in front of him who wants him. And he's trying to figure out how to process the fact that this young man's attracted to him because he's getting older, even as he, re he feels like his getting older is changing his whole erotic life. Um, it's reshuffling the deck in a way he's not he's not in control of completely because you get older whether you like it or not. You're right. 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 So does this mirror your own experience? I mean, there are pieces of it that do. So the Mo Perlman isn't me, but the, the things that he's dealing with are things I've dealt with and people I know have dealt with. And uh, I remember when I was 20, I was living in D.C. and I met a guy in a bar. I was cruising him so shamelessly, it was ridiculous, that he was laughing at me because it was like a cartoon version of cruising. He was 40. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, it's okay, I used to be you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I used to be the 20-year-old looking at 40-year-olds. I said, great, let me be an anthropologist for a second. What happens to me when I turn 40? He said, it's one of two things. Either what you're attracted to is older guys, and when you're 20, they're 40, and when you're 40, they're 60. Or you're attracted to age difference, and when you're 20, they're 40, and when you're 40, they're 20. He said, you gotta wait and see. In truth, it turns out it's not actually, at least for me, such a stark dividing line, um, because what I found is that I've got, as I've gotten older, my tastes have gotten broader. Yes. Um, the guys I'm looking at are still older. They're still 15, 20 years older, but they're also sometimes 10 years younger, 15 years younger, and occasionally my own age, which is really weird. Thing, yeah, uh, that didn't happen when I was younger. I never looked at guys my age when I was in my twenties or my thirties. It just never happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was sort of my anthropology experiment. Wow. How does this work? You tell me, like the ghost of Christmas future. Tell you tell me. Yes, that that's very um, vulnerable because you know one could use that to scare the shit. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but but I 
think it, 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 for me, that's been very much the same kind of thing. I had a very specific type in my 20s. Now I'm in my 50s and it's opened up. I still go for older guys, but yeah, I really dig younger guys now too. And guys are, are contemporaries. Oh, just, no, it feels coming. like my desire has expanded, yeah, not me, reduced. And I too. wasn't expecting that. And it, it turns out the things I was pretty rigid about in my 20s, I'm less rigid about now. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're saying that because... Again, for me, that's been one of the wonderful surprises about aging yes. is that there seems to be more on the palate. There seems to be more spectrum Absolutely. of desire than, than less. Absolutely. It used to be, I, I had, it was never like I only liked one type of guy, but there was definitely a type. Yeah. And now when I look at guys, I tend to look to see, is there one thing I can, that I like? And there's almost one thing I like I can say, well... I really like his eyes, or I really like his hair, or I really like his beard, or I really like his body. But yeah. if I can find one thing to focus on, I can focus on what I like about someone instead of, I think when I was in my 20s, I was looking at the, you know, the do not do checklist. Like, oh no, forget it, that's a deal breaker. Right. Oh, he had a cigarette, deal breaker. Oh, he had right. that kind of haircut, deal breaker. He's wearing that jacket, deal breaker. I, I don't do that shit anymore. Right. Too old. The, the, that eliminates a lot of people. It, it's great to have standards it's, and preferences, but when they're so rigid and inflexible, we, we lose a lot. And it's nicer to, I find it's nicer to have standards about the things you like than standards about the things that you don't like. Yeah, exactly. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, the bridge by which I started to even be able to ask these questions and consider these other options was beginning to use prep. Um, for me, that journey started when I turned 40 and I started using PrEP. And once the fear of HIV was gone, I noticed that my mind was open to so many other things. Because HIV, the, like, I had always been there. Yes. My journey around HIV is different in that I've never been into fucking. Mm -hmm. And so that was never... So con condoms, barebacking was never an issue to me because mm -hmm. I didn't do either. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was in my 20s, this goes back to the 90s, even when I was a teenager in the late 80s, my paranoia was around oral sex mm -hmm. because there's paranoia about everything at that point. Yes. Eventually I got over that paranoia. Paranoia about HIV and AIDS. Around HIV and AIDS. Yeah. Um, eventually I got over that. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't about prep for me. It was about getting over that and realizing mm -hmm. this is not a big risk. How did you learn that? How did you get over that? Because <sighs> um, we were still being, I remember, I mean, in the field, we were still being told to be afraid of blowjobs in the 90s. Yes. Um, yeah. There came a time, there's a few things. One was looking at what other countries were doing and realizing none of them were putting oral sex on their right. unsafe list. The other was just common sense was realizing if this was, re I don't mean that it's 100% safe. I mean that if there were, this were a serious risk, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be looking at, my God, 30, 40% of gay men in New York have HIV. We'd be looking at 100% are dead. Right. Uh, it doesn't make sense that this is a serious route of transmission. Mm -hmm. And I was having trouble getting information. I remember this is about 1992. I was living in D.C. and I went to Whitman Walker Clinic for an HIV test. I was getting them every year. And I got my test, and on the way out, um, before I leave, the doctor comes in and says, do you have any questions? I said, yeah, let's talk about oral sex and HIV. And he said, I can't tell you this on the record, I'm not gonna write it down, but you're not gonna get it. Like, this is not gonna happen. I said, okay, great, I feel much better. I go to pay on the way out. This is 15 seconds later, mm -hmm. 10 feet away, same clinic, same day, and the person doing the checkout says, so how was today's visit? Did you get all the information you came for? I said, yeah, actually it's a great visit. I feel much better. I have this question I've always wanted to ask. I asked and I got a good answer. And he said, well, what was the question? I said, well, the question was about the risk of HIV from oral sex. And he said, it is exactly as dangerous as anal sex. And you should never ever, and I said, that's the exact opposite of what the doctor just told me in the next room a minute ago. And I realized no one's going to give me a straight answer. And whether it was because of federal funding issues and things they weren't allowed to say, or whether it was about moral moral issues and things they didn't want to say, or ignorance, or misinterpreting the very little data we had. But it only made sense to me as time went on that this isn't really where mm -hmm. the risk is. Right. Um, okay. And since for me it wasn't a matter of what percentage of my sex life this would be, it was 100% of it. Yeah. 
so once I reached that conclusion, I said, this is, this is what makes sense to me, and this is what I'm comfortable with. And if, I'm, if I'm comfortable with it, I'm comfortable with it. Wow. So the logic, the rationality. The logic, and the years of observing that. Yeah. and saying it, it doesn't make sense. The notion that this is risky doesn't make sense. I'm observing the world around me, and it doesn't make sense. Wow. It was kind of like looking at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, when people were honestly trying to figure out what the risk was. Do you need to wash your groceries? Do you need to wash your mail? Do you need to wear gloves on the subway? Um, is it about droplets? Is it about aerosol? And at the beginning, it really was a question. Right. Then, once it seemed pretty clear, again, not foolproof, but pretty clear, we relaxed a little bit. Not that we let our guard down, but that we kind of knew, oh, when we're outdoors, it really doesn't matter that much. Mm -hmm. And if we're, we could start having friends over again, as long as we sat outside, six feet apart, on the porch, mm -hmm. in the open air, we didn't have to never see our friends again. We learned the important thing is we shouldn't see them indoors. This is before vaccines. Mm -hmm. But it took a while. But once we realized this is what seems like it's really happening, now we can build rules that seem like they make sense and that we're comfortable with. Because yeah. we have information. That's how I felt around HIV. It took a few years of observing to see what's really happening, what's really not happening. Mm -hmm. And then saying, this is what seems like the truth to me. Right. And based on that truth, this is how I'm going to live my life. And then once you got that, once that really became clear in your mind, what did that do for you in terms of feeling like you had the agency to explore sexuality and play with people of different ages, types? Or It, it meant, it didn't mean that much in terms of practice, it meant that much in terms of anxiety. Because mm. um, I was already doing a lot of this stuff. Uh -huh. But once the anxiety was gone, what did that... anxiety was gone, it was just like... It was just being able to focus on the pleasure of it. Yeah. And not having sort of the constant sort of Damocles hanging over you. Mm -hmm. um, realizing it's not actually there. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of risks. There are plenty of dangers. There are plenty of mm -hmm. other things going on besides HIV. Mm -hmm. But that one was the big one. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I said it's not, it's actually not mm -hmm. looming over me. Yeah. Um, which is how, yes, friends of mine who were into fucking felt with PrEP. Right. There's a similar moment of, okay. And I remember when PrEP came out, talking to those friends saying, we, we don't know yet, because it's new. Mm -hmm. Don't know yet how effective it is, how long it lasts, what the side effects are. So like, hooray, hooray, hooray. Uh -huh. But be on your guard for a couple years until you see data come in with facts. Like we've seen trials, but I want to watch how the world works. Uh -huh. And then once I saw that information, I said, okay, now I, I trust it. Because, wow. you know, I don't want to get my hopes up too much because we've seen people get their hopes up about HIV treatments before, uh -huh. that turn, same with COVID, uh -huh. where things turn out to be disappointing once they hit the real world. Right. But um, I think that between PrEP and treatment as prevention, between those two things mm -hmm. happening basically at the same time, yeah. Um, that's a complete, that's a new universe in terms of HIV, yes. risk and anxiety, and anxiety. Yes, and again, where I think one of the opportunities that leads us to now is to, especially those of us that were terrorized by that fear for decades, is to be more open. I've seen people open up and again, kind of rethink a lot of the things we're talking about. Like, yes. okay, I say I have a type. I say I have this type or I only want to do this or I won't, you know, fuck anybody with a bad sweater. But, you know, is that true? If I've questioned everything else, can I question right. these things as well? And can I maybe think about some of the limitations I'm placing in terms of the way I'm organizing information? Well, hopefully, this is what I think is hopefully the it's about thing. It's about thinking. Yeah, thinking about, about what we're thinking about. And thinking about sex, like, thoughtfully before you do it. Yes. Um, helps you decide what you want to do before you're faced with it. <laughs> yes. Or because when you're face down, it, so that, that's the worst time to make a decision. Right. So that is not the time to go it. through your consent checklist. No, it's it's really to think about that ahead of time. Yes. So, so again, so much of your work has been about sexual rights, sexual health, sexual advocacy. You were fighting in pro-choice um, movements yes. um, throughout the night. Uh, I mean, yes. today, as we're recording this, you know, we are getting closer and closer every day to Roe versus Wade being rolled back in this country. But this, people don't remember, we were. Oh you and I were doing this, fighting this in the 90s. This is not yes. necessarily new to today. We were fighting this fight in the 90s. So tell me what your what that looked like for you. So in the 90s, in the early 90s, I was living in D.C. Yeah. 
Um, and I was part of a group called Church Ladies for Choice. Now, of course, there was Church Ladies for Choice in New York. We were the DC chapter. Uh -huh. And what we would do, if you don't know, is we would dress up like church ladies in, in church lady drag, and we would go, most often, defend abortion clinics and go to pro-choice rallies. Uh, we did other things too, but primarily pro-choice uh, with abortion clinics. So in, I think it was early 93, Operation Rescue, the anti-abortion group, targeted D.C. Mm -hmm. They are having a massive blitz. And was this a federal group, like a right-wing group? Or a right-wing group, okay. uh, led by a guy named Randall Terry. Mm -hmm. They were going to like come and protest outside abortion clinics. They didn't say which ones, but there were a limited number. I think it was seven in the district at the time. And so there were pro-choice activists sort of surrounding and defending all the clinics. And the church ladies, there were maybe 10 of us, were essentially the USO of the pro-choice movement. The, what we did is we had a bunch of songs. They were sort of church hymns and old songs revamped with pro-choice lyrics. We would go entertain the troops. We had about 15, 20 minutes worth of songs. We'd go from clinic to clinic to keep people's spirits up because you're standing in the freezing cold often before dawn defending a clinic that might not even be attacked. So it's really boring. We would go and try to entertain people and we go to the next clinic. So we're doing that. We go to the clinic, we sing, people laugh. We go to the clinic, we sing, people laugh. We go to the next clinic and Operation Rescue is there. They are there and CNN is there. It's happening. And we go and we start singing our songs and we're entertaining people. And Operation Rescue, whose sole mission is anti-abortion, they are so enraged at these queers in dresses, enraged that they are just standing there screaming at us while we're singing. And we're singing goofy, silly church songs in terrible dresses and awful, awful wigs. And they are screaming and screaming and screaming in our faces. And CNN's filming the whole thing. We're done with our material. We have 15, 20 minutes worth of stuff. The clinic director comes up to us and she says, you have to keep going. We said, we're out of material. She said, they are they who have descended in a, a national spotlight target for this sole purpose. She said, they are so mesmerized and hypnotized by you. They haven't noticed we've been walking our morning appointments in the front door. Wow. They just aren't even paying attention. Keep going. Wow. So we just... We sang a couple of the same songs again. We taught our songs to the pro-choice defenders. We improvised a bit until the director came over and said, we're done. All of our appointments have literally walked in the front door while Operation Rescue was out here screaming at men in dresses. Wow. So we packed it up. We were done for the day. And I got home. My sister says, were you on CNN today in a dress? I said, I guess I was. I said, what were you doing? I said, defending abortion clinics. That's what I was doing. It's beautiful. It was a great moment. Did you ever feel like you were being physically threatened? No. All they really just wanted to scream, scream. I mean, okay. screaming until they were red in the face and spitting. It's really, they right. were so, it's so, so revolting to them. These gay men in dresses. But they didn't physically threaten you. No. Whereas today I feel like that's so much more, oh. the MO is to physically threaten or hurt people. 30 years ago, I don't remember there being as much violence. No, this was this mostly just venting anger. But it was... Yeah. Well, it was bizarre. That it wasn't like oh. they came to gay pride. They were there to shut down an abortion clinic. Yeah. And they just couldn't handle the fact they were guys in dresses. Wow. Now, people might be thinking, Wayne, you're a gay man. Why would this... Why would abortion rights matter to you? What's the segue? Because having autonomy over my own body is the essence of being a gay man. <laughs> And because gay rights... Say it again. That's the segue between abortion and gay rights. Having autonomy over your own body is the essence of being a gay man. You hear that? Uh, you, you don't have a gay movement without two things. Without sexual liberation movement and yeah. feminism. Yeah. Without the two of them, there is no gay rights movement. Those two things are the core of the gay rights movement. Because feminism is about... It's having, about having control over your own body, your own sexuality. Yeah. And having your own say-so about what you do, regardless of what gender roles you might fit into. And for a lot of people, the issue about being gay is actually has to do with gender, is defining gender expectations or not living up to gender expectations. So the notion that I as a gay man have nothing to do with feminism is ridiculous. Of course, I'm part of the reason laws are against me is because I'm not acting the way a man is supposed to act. Yeah. And restrictions, societal restrictions and cultural restrictions around masculinity are just the flip side of those around femininity. They go hand in hand. 
Um, so yeah, no, feminism is the core of it. Beautifully stated. Always have. Thank you for speaking to that, um, especially now. I think people are getting it maybe today. Yeah, you got it. I mean, because they're saying Roe versus Wade is gone, so is gay marriage. By the way, there's something. This so doing this bathtub thing always reminds me of remote control on MTV because it's like, all right, there's people coming in and up the stairs, and you're gonna hear them in the background. That's the way it is. Um, but that was the idea that we are interconnected: feminism, gay rights, racial equality, voting rights. These are all the same. This is what they call now intersectionality. Yeah. We were often practicing. Just uh, to me, it was just like made, it was unity. It was community. I, I remember I had a um, an advisor in college who. I took a, gender, a course in gender and sexuality from her. We touched on race and class and sexuality. And it was a lot, because a lot of very heavy stuff that we were talking about. At the end of the semester, she said, you know, I think a lot of you are feeling overwhelmed, like that there are so many things to worry about. There are so many battles to fight. There is so much wrong to be right in that it seems overwhelming. Mm -hmm. This is before we talked about the word intersectionality. She said, think of it this way. Think of it like it's a hammock made of a web. You don't have to attack every strand, but if you attack a couple strands, you can weaken the whole thing and it can collapse. Mm. It's like, just focus on the parts that, that you feel like you can make the most difference on and you'll destroy the entire web, uh -huh. uh, which was a great thing. It meant that you didn't have to worry about doing everything all the time that you could really focus on something and, it, and its positive effects will ripple out. It doesn't mean you should ignore other things, but you should find the thing that draws your passion the most, that is going to energize you the most, and go for it. Right. And whatever piece of that web you destroy, great. And to recognize, which I think people do today, especially younger people, that gay marriage abortion rights, Black Lives Matter, we are all talking about the same base, the same thing here and, in different ways, but these are all so, they go together, they're all so important. Well, also, I mean, it's hard to remember if you're not, you know, old, like me, but forget gay marriage. Like us, because we're the same <laughs> like age. Us. I'm the older man, four months old. Oh, yes. um, gay marriage aside, yeah. this is about sodomy laws. Like, this goes to the core of everything that undergirds the entire gay rights legal framework in this country. Mm -hmm. had to, you had to get rid of sodomy laws to make anything else possible. Otherwise, you were legalizing criminals to do things that didn't make any mm -hmm. sense. Um, that's where I think issues like abortion and choice really come at us. It's not just that, yes, the Supreme Court can overturn things that seem like settled law. That affects marriage. But really, they can overturn precedent around bodily autonomy, that's sodomy laws. Right. That hits, first of all, it hits everybody, but also as we know, sodomy laws were never evenly applied. Right. Even when they were technically uh, relevant to everyone, they were really only applied to sexual deviance right. for the most part. I mean, and, and sodomy, we think of as like oral sex, but sodomy in the legal definition is really any kind of penetration. It's a very open term, selectively enforced against gay men. And I think sometimes people under 40 don't realize that this was something that was practiced and enforced in the 70s and 80s. I mean, it's yes. up until I think the 90s, right? Yes. When Willie, Willie Brown started to... And, you, and, and, it gets, and it gets even broader and broader than that. I mean, I remember... This was in the 90s when I worked on Policing Public Sex, the first book I worked on in 96. I had gone to Providence, Rhode Island to speak. They invited me up. The gay community there was having an issue with police. There's a public park, I'm not gonna remember the name, but if you're from Providence, I'm sure you know. It's a park in a nice neighborhood that at night was a cruising ground. And some of the local gay groups had gotten together with the police because the police were cracking down on cruising. And the gay groups had got together with them and said, oh, of course, we're all on the same side. We, too, believe that public sex is a bad thing. Why? I don't know. Because your kids could accidentally stumble across people when they were going through the bushes at midnight alone for some reason. But they agreed. We're all, we're all, we all agree that we don't hate the good gays. We only hate the bad gays who have sex in the bushes. So we're going to go along with this police campaign to clean up this park. So with the approval of the gay groups, the police started going around during the day and ticketing people who were, let's say, picnicking or playing volleyball. Because those were things that were, you know, 
about to lead to sex in the bushes. Their problem, the cops, was basically gay people existing in public. Right. And the gay activists had thought they were on the same page. Like, yeah, we don't want people fucking on your porch when you're upstairs asleep. Mm -hmm. But the police were like, yeah, we don't want you even having a picnic in the park. We don't want you here at all. So when we talk about sodomy laws, it's about criminalizing a whole class of people. And once you have that, you can just branch out from there. It's the same way the public sex laws were applied in New York City in the 90s when I was working on policing public sex. Things that were not illegal under the health code, like masturbation, solo masturbation, which has nothing to do with HIV transmission, nothing, zero, absolutely zero to do with it, they would close places down for allowing masturbation because it might lead to sex. So even though it wasn't prohibited, it was effectively prohibited because it might lead to something that was prohibited. I mean, so this is where sodomy laws are, are creepy crawlies that go out in every direction. They've got to be fought. And this is where having autonomy over your own personal body is right. paramount. I mean, that is why the Stonewall riots began, right? Because people were gathered in being gay and affectionate and dancing in a space that could lead to sodomy it and could, sex. It absolutely could. And I mean, that was the basis for raiding. Dancing so often does lead to that. Yep. We all know that. I mean, we've all been doing parties. Yeah. So this is why we cannot go backward. This is why we cannot and we have to see that abortion rights and gay rights and Black Lives Matter are the same. They're all connected. Connection, yes. Okay, so you're trying to like segue to your recent book, and I, uh, so much of your work I want people to learn about, know about, but your writing is also really amazing and encapsulates a lot of these issues. Your most recent book is The End of Her. The End of Her is nonfiction. It's nonfiction. So it's, this is really your life, really it your is family. A, it is a true crime family memoir, and it is connected. Watch all connected. Okay. The, the End of Her. Racing Against Alzheimer's to Solve a Murder is a story about me trying to solve the 100-year-old murder of my great-grandmother while I'm watching my mother decline from Alzheimer's. What's the connection to all this activism? The murder took place in 1913 in Winnipeg. My great-grandmother is a new, very recent, just a few years, immigrant from Russia. She's living in the Jewish neighborhood, the Jewish immigrant neighborhood of Winnipeg, which is sort of like the Lower East Side of New York, the north end of Winnipeg at that, at that time, in a neighborhood where anti-Semitism is a huge problem. And anti-Semitism and anti-immigrant feeling almost certainly had a role in her murder, mm -hmm. which was unsolved for a century until I tried to solve it now. Uh, but anti-Semitism seems like a really big issue and anti-immigrant sentiment as well. Those two things aren't always, they don't always go hand in hand. In this case, when the Jewish community had um, immigrated from Eastern Europe in the early 1900s to Canada, so did their neighbors. So you had non-Jewish people from Russia, Ukraine, Poland, what was then Galicia, they immigrated as well, and they lived in the same neighborhood. So you had Jews who had fled these murderous pogroms in Eastern Europe, they moved to the New World, and their neighbors move with them, and the anti-Semitism from the old world moves to the new world. This is almost certainly what led to the murder of my great-grandmother. It's almost certainly motivated by anti-Semitism. The anti-immigrant sentiment comes up when the police and the journalists try to investigate. They don't believe anybody. They don't trust the immigrants, whether they're Jews or non-Jews. They don't understand them. Literally, they don't speak their language. And even in the times when it seems like they're trying to be fair. It's not always for the right reason. So there's, there's one guy who's a suspect right off the bat, from the very first day that the police are looking into. There are three newspapers in Winnipeg, and two of them are saying, he's the guy, he's the guy, he's the guy. It's a non-Jewish immigrant who lives in the same neighborhood. One newspaper says, we don't think so. We don't think it's him. But it's not that they're reluctant to charge an immigrant. What they say is... This was a crime of unusual cunning, and that guy is Polish, and those people are too stupid to commit a crime of such cunning, so it can't be him, because they're dumb. So even the newspaper that comes to his defense comes to his defense for all the wrong reasons. So the way immigrants are facing oppression in their, in their new home, and the way Jews were and are still dealing with anti-Semitism is all connected to all of this. Wow. I, I think... This is really, oh my God. So this is absolutely 
connected to the themes yeah. and also the journey of the reader while reading this. It is very much in the, the genre of, well, out of family true crime memoir, which yeah. I guess is a genre, yeah. but it is that idea of like of a mystery unfolding, an accidental discovery, and then the mystery and the confusion, again, sort of mixed in with these um, ideas of um, sexuality, your life, your yeah. relationships, the intergenerational secrets and shame yes. that have been passed down, sometimes the confusion of who remembers what, mixed in with cognitive decline. Yes. And what a fascinating roller coaster that is for the reader who's sort of on this journey with you. And you as a writer really take them on the journey of that. The, the way memory works, overlaid with issues of shame, yeah. makes for a very difficult brew. Yeah. Because my grandparents' generation didn't like to talk about stuff. They didn't like to talk about things that were uncomfortable. And my parents' generation didn't like to ask questions. So then comes me. And I'm trying to ask questions, and there's literally no one to answer the questions. My grandparents are dead. My mother's losing her memory, has now lost her memory. There's, and there's almost nothing, even when she had her memory with her, there was almost nothing she knew. Like, her father was an immigrant from Poland, from a town called Plutsk. When she was a little girl, she asked him, she said, what was Poland like? He said, it was awful, that's why we left. That's all she knew. She didn't ask any more questions, and he didn't say anything more. So I grew up knowing the, knowing the name of the town he came from. I didn't know, was it a town of 100 or a city of a million? Were, were they middle class, working class? What did they do? How big was the house? Like, what was it like? Were they taken out in the fields and shot? Were they, did they run the town? Like, what was it like? No answers. I went myself a decade ago to that town to try to learn more, which is challenging because anyone who had the answers was actually taken out in the field and murdered during the Holocaust. So there's a, there's a rupture in memory for a lot of Jews where things from the old country, you, if you didn't know them, you now can't ever know them because the people who did know the answers either have since died or were murdered. Those are kind of the two options. So trying to rebuild a family history through memories that didn't exist is a real challenge. But this book sh certainly t walks through the steps of putting that together. Yeah, I tried. It took me, it took me 10 years. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay, so The End of Her, which is available online. Online. On Paper Amazon, everywhere. Paperback, paperback, paperback Kindle, Kindle, audiobook, book. everywhere. Interesting. So, Wayne, you have been in this fight. You have been active. You have been out. You have seen changes over these last 30 years. We are in this moment of history of really difficult moment for me. I'm just going to speak for me. Um, a difficult moment in history compared to any other time in my 51 years. Given what you've seen, given what you've been through, given what you've witnessed and what you've been active for, do you find reason to be, if anything, what gives you hope or reason to carry on or think that we're going in a, do you think we're going in a good direction? And if so, what makes you think that? I think it depends on how far back you pull the lens. When I pull the lens back to the world, there are lots of terrible things happening. There always have been, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like it's new, but there are terrible things happening. When you pull the lens back to, to this country as a whole, I have a lot of trouble feeling optimistic in the short to medium term. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really get to the long term, but the short to medium term does not fill me with hope. When I pull the lens back tighter, um, I get more and more hopeful because I see people doing really great things. I see people changing their thinking. I see a lot of progress. And I don't mean um, gay marriage. Like, it's a great thing. It's terrific. I'm married. Hooray for marriage. It was never at the top of my list, but I'm, I'm happy that I'm married. Uh, and I'm happy that it's an option because it's extremely important to a lot of people. But I see people's attitudes evolving. I see people being able to see new information and take it in. And we saw that a lot around, around George Floyd. I think that was a good example of people being faced with evidence and, and saying, huh, maybe things 
aren't the way I always assumed they were. Um, maybe the things I always thought were exaggerations aren't exaggerations. Um, and maybe there's something that can be done. Maybe there's something that can be changed. There are times I don't feel so optimistic when I look at another school shooting and think, there's no, nothing's going to happen. Like, we can talk about gun control again, but it's not going to happen. It's just simply not going to happen in this country. We, it didn't happen the last 200 times. It's not going to happen this time. But sometimes I can feel more optimistic when I look at, a, at New York City or even New York State or even the Northeast. I can look at a chunk of a place and feel like, yeah, things are moving in the right direction and things are better than they were. It's some, it's sometimes it's hard to go back and remember where you were 30 years ago or 20 years ago and how things felt. Um, and in a lot of ways, they feel better now. So that's where I feel optimistic is when I can look, look and see differences that have been made in my own lifetime um, and say, yes, things do sometimes get better. It takes work. Those things are not, can't be taken for granted. They can be rolled back as we now see. But things can move forward. They can get better. It is possible. It's harder for me to see that when we look at like the state of Congress today. But it's easier to see when you look at how things have changed in New York in the past 20 years. Um, things gotten better in a lot of ways, like dramatically better. When I look at even things that happened in the state legislature in Albany, which I had no hope for for decades. Mm -hmm. In the past five years, things have really like moved. All of a sudden, Albany started getting things done. So I, I do see I do see things moving in a positive direction sometimes. Wow. Okay, that's good to know. I appreciate that that point of view. Um, I think it's much needed, and you know that's also why I wanted to have these tough talks is to hear perspective on that from people who have seen quite a few things and kind of do have that ability to pull back the lens. Yeah. You know, I sometimes look at, you know, silly videos from the 60s and 70s and like disco and the stuff we I grew up with, how much joy there was in a lot of these, these dancing and a lot of what was happening. And a lot of that seemed to be a reaction to the oppression of the 40s, 50s, and, you know, sort of coming out from this difficult period of a lot of oppression and just people saying, hey, now we can be free and dance. And and I wonder if we're going to go toward that. The power of dancing is not to be underestimated. Yeah. There is so much to be gained on a dance floor in terms of community building, breaking down barriers, coming together. And, and this, I think, is an important thing that a lot of activists, a lot of activism overlooks sometimes, is the power of joy. Yeah. And the power of silliness sometimes. That... Being, there's a reason when I go to Provincetown, I usually go dancing during the day. I go to tea dance. Mm -hmm. I don't usually go dancing at night. I usually go dancing during the day. Dancing during the day outside is a fundamentally ridiculous thing to do. It is frivolous in the extreme. You are standing outside on a deck, overlooking the water, dancing to what is often terrible, terrible music. And if you think about it that way, and you think like, oh, people are... They're really not looking their best. Their outfits are terrible. I can't believe she's dancing in flip-flops. Like, come on, get real. Or this song, this is from three years ago. Come on, are we still dancing to this? You can put that shitty attitude aside and just have fun. Dance in the sun. Throw your hands in the air. Blow a whistle. Wave a tambourine around. Like, do something really, really dumb. It is healing. The healing property of having an hour where you don't take anything seriously except having fun is really essential because otherwise, if all you do is focus on the hard work that needs to be done, which there's a lot of, if that's all you focus on, that's like a recipe for, I think, burnout and depression. There has to be that moment of release. That That is not a moment away from activism. That is activism. Yes. Dancing at tea dance is activism. It can't be the entirety of your activism, but that is essential. Do something silly. Have fun. Yes. Enjoy the people around you. Otherwise, what are we doing this for? Yes. I have always said, I believe mental health and pleasure is resistance. Yes. It's it not is. just because it feels good, which it does, no, but it's, it's also political resistance. It is. Pleasure is political. Yes. Get in the bathtub with a stranger. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love that. On that note, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for those perspectives. Thank, thank you. you for those words of wisdom. Uh, much needed. And again, I think this is how we are going to get through this is this energy, these conversations. Let's get through it. 
these these thoughts about prioritizing pleasure, um, which, as you said, is for me also synonymous with activism. Some people say, "Well, if you have fun and have pleasure. Why would you do anything?" To me, it's like that's the opposite of what I do. It's the energy. It's the nutrients. Yes. It's the very thing that keeps me going and keeps me wanting to get out there and fight and knock on doors and go to protests yes. and teach. It's that. It's coming from pleasure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. If people want to learn more about you, follow your work, get your books, hear more of your ideas, what's the best way for them to do that? WayneHoffmanWriter.com. Okay, so that's going to be on YouTube right below us, WayneHoffman.com. WayneHoffmanWriter. WayneHoffmanWriter.com. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking time to be here, for talking about these ideas. And I encourage people to, if you heard something in here that, that you want to talk about with your friends, maybe talk about your friends in your bathtubs or your swimming pools or your breakfast table, um, get off the internet, turn off CNN, talk to your friends about these ideas about what it means to have purpose, what it means to have pleasure, what it means to have community in this day and age. And how, you know, the, we confuse these ideas in a way that will continue to, what you say, undo the... The threads. Tear apart that Tear web apart of oppression. The, the web. Move out that wig of <laughs> yes. oppression. All right. Everybody, thank you for watching. Subscribe down below. Um, share with your friends. And have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.